Blog Talk Radio. Alternative facts. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over mutable locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and these objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt entering Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets, as more updates will follow as information becomes available. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. Attacks by the undead have been reported in several states across the country. The dead are rising from their graves and are attacking the human race. At this time, it is expected that more attacks of this nature will occur in several other states in the next few hours. The intent behind the attack is unknown at this time. He has been observed that a bike for exchange of fluids is a method of transmission. This is an extremely dangerous situation if they crave the taste of human flesh. It is not known whether this event will last for hours, days, or even longer. Stay calm, as authorities have been dispatched to deal with these creatures. An all-clear siren will be sounded when this situation is under control. Your host, Rodney, the Viking Shortridge, co-host, Melinda, the Raven, Jackson. Want to give a big old shout out to the Facebook paranormal groups that allow us to post our shows on their pages and helping us to get the word out about all of our guests. Also, a shout out to the Connor Sisters, hats off to Misty and Ashley. They are the founders of SOS Sisters of Salem Paranormal Research Society and host of their podcast, Paranormal Party. You can find them on Facebook under Paranormal Party. If anyone would like to speak to Black Diamond Paranormal Society, CDPS, to discuss your paranormal questions or issues, go to our website at blackdiamondps.org or email blackdiamondps at yahoo.com. As always, our services are free. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You can listen in by calling 516 516- 387-1922 or you can go to the Vibe Radio Network website at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network 
for deep within the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for listening to Within the Chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge and I'll be your host tonight along with my beautiful Raven Melinda Jackson. First off, I'd like to give a shout out to my cousins up in Ohio. Jennifer and Joe Shortridge of 222 Paranormal. If you get a chance, check out their talk show. You can find them on Facebook under 222 Paranormal. Have your devices just randomly stopped working? Are you having IT trouble? Not to worry, Mead's PC Repair Shop can help. We also offer IT support too, including website hosting. We are now also offering full event management services. To find out more, contact our friendly custom service team who will gladly help in any situation. Just call 276-880-8900 or if you prefer, you can stop by our shop at 1089 St. Clair Street, Oakwood, Virginia, 24631 by appointment only or by visiting the website at meadspcshop.com for more information. Thank you. I love how he says, thank you. Boy, we got some serious, seriousness in that. Thank you. Well, tonight our special guest is Derek Sheen. Uh, Derek is a cuddly mess of insecurities. It sounds a lot like me. Hmm. So like, we're going to have a fun night. He's a gifted comedian, storyteller, actor, and writer. So with no further ado, let's get let's get Boo Boo on here. Hello, Mr. Sheen. How are you doing tonight? And thank you for coming on the show. I am well, Rodney. Are you receiving me? Yes, I am receiving you. Yes. This is this is planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm grounded. I'm grounded on Earth. I'm very excited. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on the show, man. I've seen some of your work on YouTube and. Uh, um, and I, I, I was like, I gotta get this guy on. I gotta, cause uh, a lot, a lot of the uh, your stand up and uh, your performance, uh, I, I can, I can, I, I can, I can understand where you're coming from. So, uh, a lot of reflection there. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good to know. What? Well, Wait till you hear the new stuff. Oh, 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 oh. I can't wait. <laughs> So can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and, you know, what led you uh, on this road to become a, a comedian, writer, storyteller, actor, and a cuddly mess? Uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I started doing stand-up when I was 36. I'm 49 now. I always wanted to do stand-up. I was raised in a household with no music. We had pretty much just comedy albums. That's all my mom listened to. She loved stand-up. She really wanted to push me into it. Um, but I just, I, I even wrote some jokes when I was a kid. I had a manager for a short time, and I hated it. It scared me. I didn't like it. I wasn't funny. So I kind of waited for a long time. I, I played, uh, played and taught music for about 20 years and uh, practiced getting on stage and just trying to get rid of the jitters. And then when I got tired of playing music, I made a decision to uh, make the worst career change in my life and just quit making money so I could uh, go do stand-up full-time. Well, I was going to ask him. Uh, I was raised around it. If you're ready to ask, how's it working out for you? But you talk about not making no money, so uh, you <laughs> pimping all the time. <laughs> love, and love, and love of the game. That's what I do. Everything goes right back into an airplane ticket. But I oh, wouldn't change uh, a thing. You know, the, the worst night doing stand-up is so much better for me than my best night loading drum gear into a van for $20. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, stand-up is just so much more fulfilling, and uh, I love it, and I never, I'm I'm bad with the the money part, but it doesn't matter. I just have so much fun that that's that's all. Man, I have you know three really albums, good albums that I'm proud of, and the fourth one that we're working on, I'm really stoked about. So that's the the exciting thing for me is I I, I it's allowed me to create, and I always wanted to do it, but I think the last 
14 years that that was the right time for me to get into it. Mm-hmm. Well, w- w- with the other comedians out there in comics, what what separates you? What what makes you so? Uh, what makes your your uh, routine fine? Well, I think what sets me I, I I don't know what sets me apart. I think it's probably my voice. The way that I approach the material is really unique for me. I think I found a, a, a sort of unique way of 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 telling jokes or telling stories, and I have a knack for being able to um, to convey a lot of really creepy, dark stuff, but find a way to make it funny. And uh, I, I think if, if anything, uh, with me, you get uh, sort of in the moment, uh, honest, genuine, uh, but very, very dark comedy, which I'm sure there are other people. There's a lot of comics out there that kind of do what I do, but – we're all we all set ourselves apart by how far we're willing to to go out on a limb, and uh, I am I'm very good at pushing the envelope as far as I can, and I'm cute and dumb and lovable, so it's really hard for people to get mad at me. Aww. Well, do, do you, <laughs> you just make it just kind of makes you want to just squeeze you when you describe yourself like it's like oh he's so cuddly. That's what people say about me. It's like, all my life, you know, I'm a big old boy too, and I'm probably a lot bigger than you. But you know, you hear all these girls say, you know, he's handsome or he's gorgeous. I always get said, you know, like, Rod, you're so you're so cuddly. You know, I'm like, well, could you at least say I'm handsome? I mean, slide that in there. I mean, I I I prefer uh, I I've, you know I'm 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 turning fifty this year, so I prefer no longer to be handsome. I prefer to um, I prefer to be cuddly because uh, oh. that means that I you know I I can't go anywhere from there I can just stay that way now like oh. I, I I much rather a handsome fifty year old is creepy but you know <laughs> uh, a cuddly fifty year old that's the guy you want to hang out with you know and you feel safe feel safe around him and apparently I've been looking at this all wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, do, do you ever, you know, you said that uh, it shakes the jitters out earlier. Do, do you still get nervous before you do a show or while you're doing a show? Absolutely. I still get nerves. Uh, it happens. I, I, I suffered from crippling stage fright, uh, which is why I started playing music. It was another reason why I was afraid to do stand-up, because I had so much uh, anxiety that I would have these crippling panic attacks. And so I started uh, getting on stage little by little with other people. I felt like it would be easier to – I literally just sat at home and learned to play an instrument so I would have a reason to get in a band and, and get out on stage because I really wanted to be out there, but I felt like I needed to do baby steps. And so that was what got me back on stage. That and bananas. Boy, I can't tell you enough. Uh, the miracle the miracle fruit, the banana, the potassium – is uh, amazing for uh, uh, pre-show uh, uh, jitters. Gets rid of them real quick. All my students eat a banana. I tell them all of them eat a banana before you go on stage. It's amazing. Never heard that. That's awesome. All the uh, potassium it takes your uh, body, uh, your stomach, a little a little more energy to break it down. So uh-huh. it has a, uh, I guess it has sort of a, what are they, I mean, it's not an endorphin. Well, I guess it is an endorphin uh, or a serotonin blast. So it kind of calms you down. You know, all your body's trying to break down this banana, and it calms your nerves because it's very dense and heavy. And uh, it's also, uh, potassium is also a natural um, depressant. Hmm. Well, I've been doing it all wrong. I've been using alcohol. Huh. Who knew? No, that works really well. <laughs> but I've never known anybody who's had a had too many bananas and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> woken up in the bathtub of a Motel Six. So it's never happened. Yeah, that, that 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 that's true. It does make makes a big difference. Um, no one's ever gotten a BUI. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sure if they could find a way to make it illegal and make some money off of it. <laughs> so, 
So did you did you do a lot of uh, open mic nights when you were starting out, or? Uh, uh, oh man, every, every night, every night. Every night. I, I went out every single night. Like I would hit as many mics as I could. When I was starting out, I would go to uh, the two open mics at my local comedy club every Sunday and Monday, and then I would hit the indie kind of alt comedy mic on Tuesday, and then Wednesday was another club, and then Thursday was. Uh, open mic at the other club across town and then Saturday, Friday, Saturday would just go to the club and watch comedy. I mean, I was, I was out every night. It was a real, it was a real shift in, in, um, my, my mood, my behavior. I was out all the time. You know, I was married too. So even when I played music, if I had a rehearsal, we rehearsed twice a week, but with comedy, I was out every single night. And, uh, it was, uh, it was, I mean, I still do it. I still, I'm still uh, hitting mics every time I'm in town. I'll try to hit, you know, a, a Tuesday or Wednesday mic uh, just so I can see new comics. And, and I also just kind of like that, that smaller set and the pressure of having it perform in front of people who didn't pay to get in. So they have no investment. <laughs> I like it. it. It pushes you as a comic. I'll never stop doing it. I, I, I love comedy so much that, that the fun part is performing for me. Uh, but I, 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 I tell new comics, you got to be out every night, you know, and you have to be hitting every, every opportunity for you to be on stage, take it. Now you are from Seattle, Seattle, Washington, right? Correct. So I take it. There's a lot of uh, comic clubs in your area. What would you tell someone like in my area in the middle of, you know, nowhere, uh, say the comic club, the closest one to like, I don't know, five, six hour drive. See, that one's tough because if you're really far from a scene, you kind of have to build one yourself. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of have to start your own mic and, and you have to try and get other people interested and, you know, and let them know that like, Hey, you know, we're going to try and, make an open mic night for just comedy and we'll I, I guarantee you if you started an open mic for stand up you would find that there's other people around who are like, Oh, I wish there was one, I'm gonna do that. And mm-hmm. the next thing you know, you ha you you know, you've got five or six comedians or, you know, at least open mic open micers who are, you know, getting their foot in the water and then you have people in town who are like, Oh, there's comedy here Monday and Tuesday. We gotta make sure we show up for it. Because it's entertaining, and otherwise, you know, it's a five-hour drive to the club. And the next thing you know, you got an open mic on Thursday because someone started one in another bar, and then you got two mics and different audiences, and eventually you start building your own thing. You know, I know okay. there's like Seattle and Portland both did it that way. They really pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, and you know, for uh, for for towns that and they had clubs in the '80s, and then they all went they all went hits up after the the bust in 90 or 91 and so you kind of had to build your own scene and it starts with one person who's like I, I need an open mic I want to try it and you got to find a bar or a garage or or a restaurant or a black box theater or something some space you can use uh, to host it especially a place with a PA if you have a music club or someplace that has a, a bar with a setup for a band, ask them for an off night. Hey, Monday night, can I try and do an open mic? And the next thing you know, you'll have like people coming out of the woodwork who want to, you know, who want to talk into a microphone and, and it will be terrible, but it, mm-hmm. it's how you build it, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. But if it's five hours to the nearest club, that's hard. That's really hard. I think that's the only way to do it is to build it yourself. Uh, that's pretty much the way everything is around here. You got to build it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what process do you use to develop your 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 stand up uh, uh, material? Oh man, I have a real weird uh, routine now. I used to write everything down, and I had a notebook that I carried with me, and I was constantly filling it out. And I'm I'm in a place now where I I have a weird process. I don't write anything down. Occasionally I'll 
I'll take a bullet point uh, on my phone just so I have it, a, a reference point. But now I'm very much about uh, trying to pull from my life experience and write about that and find the underbelly to all those experiences so that it's not just a story. It's, you know, I have, I have things I can add or subtract to it and make it, and, and make it interesting. Um, but a lot of it is just pulling those, those nuggets out and then going out to an open mic and getting on stage for a few minutes and just seeing how it fits, where the language is, what do, you know, where do I start, where do I be, you know, where do I end, and then just building. I, you know, sometimes it'll take me for a five- or seven-minute piece. It can take me a year, which is it's terrible. I know comics are way faster. They can get it, they can write a joke and have it tight within, you know, a few weeks, but I'm, I really am a weird perfectionist on, on that stuff. I think I've gotten worse as I've gotten older. But it, it sometimes takes me a year to get that seven-minute chunk. But I'm also working on, like, nine other things at the same time. But it, it's a slow process. Uh, I have a lot of friends. I don't recommend what I do. I, I don't write things down, and I don't record my sets. I, I don't record it until I feel comfortable with the joke. And then I record it to hear how it sounds once I've ironed out all the things I know, you know, are part of my, 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 my pattern. Because I don't want to get dissuaded. I don't want to hear the joke when I'm just starting to write it and go, ooh, I, should, I, I like to have it organically come out of me. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, it, it, was a, it took me a long time to learn that process, to learn to just trust myself and uh, take my time and learn how to sort of separate your right and your left brain so that you can think ahead of yourself. And, and uh, uh, but for me, I, I, I have, a, I think you've heard a lot of the stuff. So it has a very particular style of language. Like every word has a, it has a, you know, has a purpose. I don't, I don't have a lot of, of, of junk, even though I have these long stretches of dialogue. Uh, you know, everything's in its own place. It, it belongs there. And I've gone through a long process of just pulling shit apart and trying to figure out what goes where. And so I'm, I'm getting worse as I get older. It's taking me longer because I'm much more particular. There's no wrong. But I, I recommend writing. <laughs> Write it down. I say for you know anybody else. Mine is a terrible. It's a bad. I have bad habits, but they just work for me. And I think uh, I you know when I've done classes in the past, I've told my students just always be writing things down. I think you, you figure out when you're a few years in and you really know what your voice is and what you're doing, then you don't necessarily need to remind yourself as often. But I think when you're building that repertoire, uh, you know, that, 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 that set, it helps to have some guideposts along the way and having a, having a notebook with you is essential because when you start doing stand-up, it's a whole new thought process. It's a whole new language and, Things are coming at you at lightning speed now. You start thinking of premises all the time. You're you're like an antenna that's finely tuned, and you you will constantly be writing ideas down, even if none of them go anywhere. You have to write every little thing down because you don't know what's going to stick. And I, but I think you get to a point where you can start sort of sussing out, making a map or mapping a plan of what you want to do, and then it, writing becomes a little easier. Well, speaking of language, have, have you ever been, I don't know, just say some small town or, uh, and, you know, you're, you're up there and you're doing your, uh, your routine and, you know, you're just, fuck this, fuck that, fuck you motherfuckers, and then everybody just goes <laughs> silent on your ass. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, um, gotten better at being able to read audiences so that I kind of know where where their energy's at and how what they're what they're w- willing or capable of putting up with and uh, and I learned I, 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 I get this question actually when I'm uh, a lot when I when I come back home or if I do stuff on the coast because I, I travel a lot in the south and and the southeast and the upper midwest and I do a lot of political stuff and I make a lot of jokes and everybody's like, aren't you afraid to make those jokes out there? And I'm like, well, no, because I test the audience to see 
you know, what they're willing to take. Like, I'm not jumping into a room and, and beating them with a cudgel. If they're not into it, I'm just not going to, you know, I have other jokes. But I also don't mind pulling that stuff out if I can trim it or, you know, fit it in in a way that everybody still kind of feels included, even if they don't agree with me. Um, but that's a weird, you know, that that's a skill that took me a long time to learn how to do. Uh, but I still bomb. I mean, I still go out and, you know, I'll, I'll still eat shit in front of an audience. It happens. It just happens. You can't win 100% of the time. It just doesn't happen, you know. Mm-hmm. But... I eat shit in a whole different way than I used to. <laughs> when I used to eat shit, it was uh, it was horrific. It was a plane crash. It was a tragedy. There was debris. And now when I eat shit, uh, it's because I'm at the you know, I'm at a uh, I, I'm at a Motel Six breakfast buffet, and it's nine in the morning and it's almost over and there's nothing left but bagels and no cream cheese. And that's the closest to eating shit that I get now. You know, I won't get tons of laughs, but you fail differently. It's a different kind of failure. Mm-hmm. You have contingency plans the longer you've been in stand-up where you have an early warning system to let you know, uh-oh, if I keep going in this direction, I'm going to lose everybody. And you you learn to avert and uh, you you refocus and – you have an, uh, you you, take, you get out the map in your head and try to figure out how to get from point A to point B without losing them. Well, how how long are you normally up on stage? It, it, does it depend on the uh, 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 the venue? Um, it depends on yeah. Well, I think it more depends on the show. Like if I'm headlining, I'll be on stage for an hour or a little over an hour um when i'm on the road with my friend brian i'm uh, 20 20 to 30 minutes you know five shows uh, a weekend uh but if i'm doing my own thing i usually i try to to you know i'm already going to do an hour so i usually let them know that i'm going to go long uh unless it's i'm doing a club that has a hard out and i have to be out at a specific time i'll usually push it I, I'm just trying to I'm trying to bone up for this album next month, and I realized that uh, you know the the label wants me to do an hour, fifty to an hour, which is no problem. But I think I have an hour and thirty five minutes of material, and I I I don't want to say no to anything, you know. So I, I'm at a point now where uh, I, I I'm doing more than I probably should but I'm having so much fun that it seems to, nobody seems to mind. Uh, but I usually do an hour or over. Okay. Well, do you use uh, any of your childhood stories, you know, any type of embarrassing childhood stories? Cause oh, I know I, absolutely. I'm, really I'm, big I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of that stuff right now. I mean, I'm, I'm talking a lot about this whole, this whole set is kind of about turning 50 and, and so there's a lot of reflection uh, where I, I do talk a lot about my past. And I have a particular story about my dad that I've been telling. It's been working really well. And I'm, I think this next hour that I'm already starting to look at and map it out, I have a lot more personal stuff in there. But I, I'm doing a lot more of it because I'm I'm learning how to mine from within uh, I used to have to figure out, like, I got to look at the news and I got to, you know, I got to be on the internet and look at stuff and see, like, if something pops out of me that I can write about. But I think I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable enough in my own skin now that I've been more, it's easier for me to tell real stories and just find the, the, the awkward part of that story that nobody wants to hear and make that funny. And so a lot more of that stuff is coming, but yeah, my childhood stuff, I mean, uh, and, and I'm working on a book. So some of that stuff I'm kind of saving for that, but I don't know when that book's ever going to get done. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in and out of it, but there's a lot of childhood stuff. You know, my dad was in the mob. So I, uh, I have an awful lot of banana stories about that growing up with my, I'm not meeting my dad until I was 16, but kind of falling right into that trap of, you know, being my 
my dad's new son who, you know, had no idea what a fucking crazy life my dad lived. Um, the, it's a lot of that stuff starting to come out in my stand up, but we'll see. We'll see how far I go with it. That's awesome. Well, what's your opinion, you know, on the mental health of the U.S. and do you do you work that into your shows? I do. I actually, I do. I, I do get my toe in it, but I, in a way that I think is probably it's probably the most me way to do it. Uh, but I've been talking about how how bad I am at political comedy because I'm a very emotional person. And so I don't have a metered response to things, I, which is why I don't do it. You know, I, I just uh, – I don't have a um, – I don't have the, that, that sense of, like, clever dialogue where I can sort of drill down on an issue and, and find all the uh, – sort of all the um, un, 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 unspoken, unseen parts of it and, and make it into a clever, well-spoken, pointed bit. I'm terrible at that. I just get mad, and then I say something really shitty, and so I have I have a joke in my set now that we're it, it'll be on the album, but it kind of drives that home, and it's it's just it's just really mean and shitty, and because uh, I'm bad at it. I mean, I, I have opinions. I can talk about politics when I'm off stage, but I'm not good at it on stage. I'm so bad, and I have way too many friends that are way too good at that that I would. I just would never try and encroach on it because I'm, I'm so bad. I, and and I do talk about it on stage, but in a way where everyone's like, "Oh Jesus Christ!" You know, they <laughs> they just got a shock reaction to it. So, uh, but we do. I mean, I I do it because I mean, I do. I definitely try to. Uh, I definitely try to do that bit everywhere I'm at now just because I love the reaction, it really does tend to, um, for some people, it just is a huge, like, uh, like a, a big relief laugh because of where I take them. And then for some people, it's kind of like a, they just, they're, they're happy because they're like, Oh my God, you're saying something that I agree with. And I wish I could say out loud, but I can't. And so I get a little of, of both of those and it feels really good. And from, you know, from conservatives and from liberals, I get the same reaction, you know. And I, I get conservatives that are like, oh, man, after you, I'm pissed that I laughed at that bit. So that always makes me happy. Oh, it does me too because, you know, I, I, where I live in Virginia, I'm in nothing but a sea of red. I call it the area of blood. <laughs> And I'm the only blue dot of life floating around in it. And <laughs> anytime I start, and I do, I like talk about politics. I do. I love talk shit to these people, and and they give me hell. And I mean, I've even got death threats over it. And I'm like, come on, people. You know, it's just my fucking opinion. Calm down. Yeah. Everybody so what, chill out. You know, I, I kind of goes to my next question. What, you know, what's your opinion about you know Facebook and keyboard cowboys? Well, I mean, I got a lot of that. Uh, you know, bef- during the election last uh, last time in 2016, I mean, holy cow! I anytime I would even make a joke, I I would get a, a mountain of negative responses from everywhere. I mean, I, I got, and I, it ended up like at one point, I, and I posted about it on Facebook uh, uh, when it happened, but I mean, I even got death threats. Like I got phone calls from people calling me and telling me they were going to rape my wife while I watched. And, you know, I had one guy who threatened to fly into town and uh, kill my family before he killed me. And I was like, what? Like, wait, I made a joke about Trump. Like who, like who's a snowflake? Like, <laughs> Who's a snowflake? Like yeah. you know, you haven't even met the guy. I don't, you're gonna go fly. You're gonna fly first. You're gonna pay like seven hundred bucks to fly all the way across. The, it's seven hundred dollars. Like just go do something nice for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you got to spend the rest of your life in jail for murdering somebody over a what a shitty life that turns out to be. So I got a lot of that. I I I don't know. I um I I. 
definitely consider myself, uh, like, as a comic, sorry, and I keep saying like and um, which I, I hate, but I consider myself a comedian who likes to think before they speak. But I definitely do troll a lot of politicians on, you know, I'll drag people on Twitter. And it is, it is, it's still trolling. Even when I, if, uh, even though I have, I think I have comedic intent and, and I, and look at me, I'm being satirical. I'm still being a troll, but, but I'm not trying to stir up uh, nastiness or, or, or make people feel unsafe. I'm just poking fun at stuff. And I think there's, I think we're, it's going to get worse. This election season is going to be real bad. It's going to be even worse. If we thought that social media was shitty in 2016, it's going to be, it's it's going to be, it's going to be sink or swim. I'm going to get to a point where I'm either going to have to be all my chips in or I'm going to have to get out of it completely because I think it's going to get real ugly. I think we're on the cusp of a real big, like, I think people are going to get hurt. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, violence, and I think that it's going to start online, and it's just going to keep escalating. Because it already, you know, it already started two years ago. It was already kind of getting uh, like that, and and the people just don't have control of their emotions anymore. And they're so angry, and they're spun out, and they're so every day. The news just all day from from bell to bell is just nothing but the world's on fire. Everyone is uh, white, uh, white nationalism, uh, global climate change, fucking, uh, uh, you know, uh, starvation, flooding, uh, storms nobody was ready for, murder, assassination, uh, violence, uh, political violence. Uh, people are so spun out and so stressed out that, I think a lot of folks are looking for an excuse without even knowing it to just go on their own personal purge. And unfortunately I think Trump is a great manipulator and, 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 uh, uh, and, and a profiteer when it comes to uh, playing on people's emotions. And I mean, even today on the plane, reading the, the Mueller report and then uh, dipping into uh, the satellite TV on the plane, uh, listening to the news, I'm like, holy shit, how is everybody not just losing their minds right now? Like, this, this guy's still going to fight and fight and fight. And when it comes time to campaign in a couple months, it's going to be ugly. I mean, I, I I've already made a prediction that we're going to see people in the press get dragged out of the press box and beaten in public. Like it's going to be like 1938 in Berlin. It's going to be public beatings by, you know, people who all start wearing the same kind of uniform too. They want to make sure that everyone knows they're a, they're a follower and not a you know, phony. So we're something that makes you stand out. <laughs> and that's how it always starts. You know, don't just yeah. wear a, a MAGA hat. Wear something else, too. Wear a nice vest that makes you stand out. Anybody can buy a hat or, you know, some kind of robe or a hood, something that just makes you stand out. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Where, how do you feel about it? Has anybody ever – I see you're interviewing, but uh, my question, how do you where do you – where do you land on How are you feeling about this? I, I'm afraid that our Constitution has been trumped all over. By Trump, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that, like you said, uh, the people, you know, the the news reporters, are going to be drug out of the boxes, and it, either somebody's going to get killed or hurt really bad. I mean, he he incites violence when he's at these damn conventions or uh, whenever he's at these gather political gatherings. He's he's a dangerous he's a dangerous man. He knows. Yeah. He knows how to push people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. And uh, you know, in my area, I, dude, I'm just I'm screaming at, at a wall. These people around here, they, they've drunk the Kool Aid so much that, I mean, they turn into zombies. They're just zombie Trumpers. And uh, oh, it, yeah. it, it, it scares me. It really does because I got you know I got five grandkids. I've got 
uh, you know, even a couple of my son, you know, my two sons, they they drank the Kool Aid too, and I'm like, oh my God, what is wrong? I did not teach you all this, and it it, it worries me. It worries me because I mean, the man, okay, if he didn't collude, there's a whole lot of shit there that shows that he knew what the hell was going on, and uh, obstruction of justice. I mean, you know, Mueller's just like passed that ball over to. Congress and I think Nancy Pelosi and them are going to have to impeach his ass. Yeah, That's I think we're point. coming down to that. Yeah, I mean, there's no way of getting around it. I know a few weeks ago she's like, well, we're not even going to talk about that. And I think it was she was going to wait till the report came out. Now the report's out. Yeah, and I think it's also stupid that, you know, we have a sit in president or any president that's above the law. When the shit does that happen? He can't be well, indicted. Then, I mean, if there was ever any, if there, if, if if anyone was lacking the evidence to convince themselves that he thought he was above the law, today having the attorney general get out ahead of the Mueller report in an investigation where he is the number one target of that investigation, to have the attorney general come out and play defense attorney to the United States while the while the, the deputy director is standing next to him who was responsible for hiring Robert Mueller and not having Robert Mueller there. Like immediately I went, well, this is what defense attorneys do. They get out ahead uh, with their client and make statements like this and try to downplay it as quickly as possible. And this is our attorney general, the guy who's supposed to be, I mean, he's, he's the, he's the head of the department of justice and this is a guy who oversees our judicial branch, and it's bananas to me that he's in the you know he's in the tank for a president, which means there's no chance of oversight as far as mm-hmm. the FBI is concerned, as far as the DOJ is concerned. There's no chance of legitimate oversight, and when we lose that, that's when we start saying goodbye to democracy because if we can't hold our if we can't hold our elected officials accountable and we just start climbing uh, 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 the, the, the party ladder and we, we forget that, you know, we start forgetting that, Oh yeah, it doesn't matter. These are people that are elected to take care of us. So once they stop concentrating on that and are more focused on staying elected, uh, you know, taking advantage of their power position to enrich their friends, then we've lost all hope. Mm-hmm. And, and when people like when people like William Barr are willing to sacrifice their respectability and and their credibility to stand in front of the United States and make that statement this morning without Robert Mueller present, and then to insult Robert Mueller as well, the guy who wrote the report, I'm like, I've never seen anything like this. We're outside of the Nixon realm at this point. We're 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 blazing a whole new trail. Mm-hmm. Oh, I agree. I agree hundred percent with that. Man. I mean, I didn't mean to jump off from politics, but you know, politics, you know, <laughs> has a lot to do with, you know, a lot of comedy. I mean, right now where everybody is so uptight, everybody's like, I'm right. You're wrong. I mean, just flat out. And, and, and just me being in the South, uh, I loved Obama. I voted for him both times. I think he's a great president. I mean, granted, there's some things he did I didn't agree with, but he still, I think, did a great job. But people around here in my area, oh, my God, they you'd think it was Satan himself that crawled out of the White House. And, and I'm like, you're saying that Obama was this evil person, but yet you all, you all will defend the pussy grabber? I mean, come on. That makes right. no sense. And you all are Christians. That's the, the this is the big part that bothers me around here, is I live in the Bible Bible Belt, but yet all these Christians in my area support this some bitch. Even though it goes against everything that they hold dearly to the Bible. I think we're I think we're in a new age though where uh modern Christianity has been um it's it's branded and monetized so it's 
uh, and, and modern Christianity, uh, uh, not even Christianity really. Uh, uh, um, there's sort of a, a secularism to it now, and it's you, you, when you see people like uh, uh, like Robert Jeffress and all these other pastors that are saying that Trump is anointed and that he actually, you know, he is chosen by God, which is what, like Michelle Bachman said that yesterday. He was literally chosen by God, and I, 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 when I heard that shit about Obama, it made me sick because I'm like, no one is, no, that's not how, no one is uh, divinely uh, uh, chosen for this job. <coughs> they, he had a lot of money, and he ran, and he has no piety, and he has no virtue. So, no, that's not, like, that's not, God's not running through that man like a conduit. We all know that. It's uh, it's because these people enrich themselves, uh, and they see uh, that uh, they see that they, there's some um, uh, a, a chance that they can manipulate because they have uh, favor. Uh, they have that that Christian right uh, 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 polling strength, and they love to uh, they love money. I mean, their whole church is built on money. It's built on money, and it's not built on a middle class or, or the poor or doing anything uh, Christ-like. It's the, I mean, I, maybe they're Old Testament Christians. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe they're Old Testament and pre-Christ, but they just don't have a name for what they do because Philistine, you know, sounds so horrible. So we don't like to use that word. But, but it seems like they're, old, they're reading only the Old Testament. They're not getting into the real, the actual Christ stuff and reading that where Jesus is not the, every time they, they say something, I'm like, that's not a thing that Jesus said. He was a, a, a forgiving and loving hippie who had an anger problem because he was raging against the Anne Randian uh, uh, railroad system of the Roman Empire. So uh, say again how you don't want to help the poor. Like, <laughs> it's very unique. It's very unique to me that Modern Christianity has sort of been, I think it's been taken hostage by mega churches and uh, evangelicals uh, who are not Christians. They are personalities. They are personality. They're provocateurs. They're, uh, it's like when I, uh, what was it, Matt Gatz that uh, called out uh, someone for not being a good Christian and then he said oh they're Presbyterian or they're Episcopalian or whatever they're, that's not a real Christian and I was like wow now we're, now we're just going to start dividing the lines between like who's a, a better Christian Episcopalians or <laughs> like wait what so it's, it's, it's unique that's not what Christians do right that's not, not how we were raised to believe that it's not how I was raised to believe that um, you're a good mate. Christian you don't you don't attack uh, for another person who's a Christian because you think that their Christianity is not as good as your Christianity. That's the, that's the most antichrist thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. Well, I agree. Well, <laughs> this kind of goes into what we're talking about. Are, are you ever worried about offending someone, you know, in this uh, a politically correct society now? No, because, you know, Brian and I have been talking about this a lot, uh, Posehn, because, you know, we're both older dudes. We're both older white dudes doing stand-up. And, and we, we're, we're, we were caught in that crossfire of, of trying, you know, being held, held to account to do the right thing, and, and which we do. And we both were talking about the fact that, like, we never really – I wasn't afraid when people were like, hey, you know – Maybe don't be a shithead. Like maybe don't don't tell some of those jokes. Like you don't need to anymore. We, we're past that point. We've evolved. Um, but I sure heard a lot of like my my comrades. Well, they're taking my words away, and I can't say certain things. And you know, and the word police are going to come and get me. I was like, well, nobody ever said that you weren't allowed to say anything. People suggested that maybe you think about what you say before you say it because we've gotten away with it for so long we forgot to ask permission. And no one took it. You know, I tell comics, especially like uh, newer comics, who are like, what am I supposed to do? Like, 
you know, I guess I can't make jokes about anything. And I'm like, well, I make jokes about everything, but I just, I can make jokes about everything. There's nothing off limits, but I have to know how to write that joke so that I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, the, the, the term is punching down, but there's got to be a better term for that. But I'm, but I'm not taking advantage of someone or a victim as the punchline of a joke. I wouldn't do that in my real life. You know, I wouldn't, you know, I don't see people who are developmentally disabled or people who have uh, a physical disability or I don't, I don't use those people as fodder for jokes in my everyday life. I don't do that because it's wrong. And so I think if you're on stage and you're getting laughs for that stuff, sometimes you have to wonder if you're getting the right laughs or if you're telling the right jokes, because if anybody gets offended, I'll listen. I'm more than willing to listen. Uh, but I, I'm also mindful of what I'm saying now. I'm, I'm just more consciously aware of it. The thing that Brian says that I love is um, there's always been rules. There's always been rules, but we just have to follow them now. That's the only difference between now and 10 years ago is people are just asking us to follow the rules. That's all. <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's hard. Comics get real caught up on that. Like uh, some comics do. And I think it's because they just, they don't want to write better jokes. I can be fucking dark. I can be super dark and I can say some awful things, but, but I can say them, uh, I can, but I'm saying the right awful things, you know, I, I'm finding, I find a, a way to have some empathy and not, not write about, uh, uh, shit that I know is going to like be painful for someone, but I can definitely talk about some horrific stuff. The shit I get away with, you know, I, I think is just as offensive, but I'm not hurting anybody. No one's a victim in the joke. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not pointing out a group, a marginalized group, and making fun of them. I don't, I don't have any jokes about how shitty homeless people are because I'm like, ah, it sucks, you know? And it's a bummer. I can write better, darker stuff than that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, I mean, it, but it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge for a comedian and a writer to elevate, elevate and try to write at a higher level so that uh, find that sweet spot where you can be you can still be dark and gross and, and a little mean, but there doesn't have to be a victim. And, and I think that's where comedy gets lost. I, you know, we've been, Brian and I talk a lot about like just trying to remain inclusive. I'll make political jokes, but I make political jokes. If I, if I do a joke about like, you know, the joke I was telling you about earlier, like if I do this hardcore joke about Trump, I also have, you know, on the last album, I had 20 minutes on liberals telling me not to make jokes about cannibalism Mm -hmm. because I, I, I I think it's more about just the audacity of, uh, uh, of being offended and the entitlement that comes with being offended. But, but I'm more worried if I offend somebody, I'm more worried because it means that I, I might have neglected one of my own rules. And so, but there's also times that I'll be honest, people just get offended because they're, that's their reaction. And, and that, that stuff I don't give a shit about. Like if someone gets offended because I, uh, I said something that was triggering only to them, uh, I, I, you know what, and go see a therapist. Go, go talk to somebody professionally because you shouldn't, you shouldn't have that reaction in public if you're not dealing with your shit. But I don't make jokes about stuff that, you know, where there's, uh, I definitely don't do rape jokes. I don't do jokes where there's a victim or, or there, you know, something horrific that happens to people every day. I mean, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I try to stick to myself. I think that's the one thing I've, I've, I've been noticing more lately is my, uh, the last few years, my jokes have been more interior, uh, monologues and less, it's more of how I look at the world through my own filter, through my own experience. And I think that's what's changed things is I don't have to have a premise anymore. I don't have to talk about race and I don't have to talk about uh, gender fluidity uh, through the, uh, the, the spectrum of uh, a, a, a premise or a setup. I can just 
literally have that that conversation with an audience through my own my own experience and try to use that and find a way to shoehorn something in that I want to use or I want to talk about. Um, I do it with um, I do it with a bit. I think I, I, did I already do this bit? I um. I kind of have a habit of, of, of doing – I have a bit about millennials because uh, every male, older male comic has a bit about, ah, kids are oh, – these kids and blah. And I'm, I'm – uh, it's not an anti-millennial joke. I'm pro-young person. Uh, and so I, I kind of go after my friends, and I'm like, you guys are all old guys, and you shit on young people, and you're just jealous and making fun of avocado toast, which is just lame. And because uh, that's they're always the go-to, oh, avocado toast and uh, participation trophies, and I make I make fun of my own generation, uh, but then I also make fun of young because I want to bring that in. I wanted to, I actually wanted to talk about like inclusivity in comedy, and I wanted to talk about um, uh, this sort of liberal, this more liberal idea of like this younger generation trying to fix things, trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, tear down this sort of this gender binary system and, and allowing people to be who they want to be and bringing everybody in. And then I shit all over millennials at the end of it anyways. So I found a way to bring my, some of my politics into a bit, but I put them in like, um, I put them in like medicine. And, and when you're trying to feed an animal medicine, you put it in a treat. Uh, so you get them laughing about stuff, and you throw things in little little bullets here and there uh, with your own personal politics. And and I feel like I write better that way than if I tried to come up with a premise. Because at least I have something I can talk about from my heart that's real, and I don't have to force a narrative. Uh, and I think that's where people get track, especially when they're writing offensive material, is they start off thinking they have to write offensive material. So they just go full bore, and they don't have any nuance. You can write a joke that is offensive, but it didn't start that way. It just it just is offensive, and that's the big difference between writing a clever a clever offensive joke and just being offensive. Um, you know, one one you have some some strategy, and the other one you know, you're just kind of being an asshole. And so. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm 49 too, so uh, um, with my body breaking. Oh, you know what this is about. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. So, uh, do do you use your your personal health as a uh, comedic talking point at at, you know any of your uh, shows? I mean, I do. I I talk about my. uh, I've talked quite a bit about my depression. Um, and my medication. Uh, I'm now talking about the fact that I, I'm off of it. Um, this new hour, a lot of it is about like kind of changing and getting older, but it's also about getting sober. It's a, I have a probably a good 15, 20 minutes on my alcoholism and my recovery and, and, you know, and then falling into to marijuana and, uh, Like, it's a whole different thing. And the alcoholism stuff is all, I think in the, I'm going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back, but I think in the wrong hands it could be really ham-handed or, you know, really, really shitty and and boring. And I think I found that right formula to talk about my alcoholism in a way that makes it really fucking funny and it doesn't, you know, I don't have, I'm not asking for pity from the audience and I... I kind of go full bore on how much I miss it, like how much I really miss booze and, but how it really was, that's how I, I medicated for my depression. And I think the last album or the one before that, I talked about suicide, my suit, like my suicide, uh, you know, thinking about it, going through it and having those, uh, that sort of last day on earth mentality. And, uh, but you find that, you know, if you don't find the humor in it, then that stuff, that's that's when it takes you down. But I found that it's better to talk about it with an audience and make it funny because maybe somebody in that audience gets something from that, and maybe they're feeling the same things I'm feeling. And when they realize that they can laugh at it, 
a little bit, then it takes the power away from that feeling. And it, for maybe for a second, they think about something else. And that, I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at doing that, um, make it, making it my own experience is a, a, a very good way to relate to people uh, when you want to let them know that you empathize is by telling them, hey, you know what, I, the same thing happened to me. Let me tell you my story. And, and it always, you know, when, when that happens, it makes you feel, it disarms you, it takes away your fear, and then you're like, oh, I'm not alone. Okay. What I'm feeling isn't unique or special. And I think when it can, for me, for comedy, uh, when I was able to laugh at things that scared me, when I had when I could listen to a comedian break down something that I had a, a problem with and I could relate to them and at the same time go, Oh shit. Like they, I'm laughing at this thing that, that bothered me or scared me. And now it's not so scary. So like when you laugh at your, if you laugh at a high school bully, you know, it destroyed them. If you laughed at a guy who was constantly trying to pick on you and fight you, it would just ruin that person. And that's what fear is like. When you're able to make fun of it and laugh at it, it takes its power away. So I, I, I try to do that in my act quite a bit. I feel like since I'm suffering from it, I might as well benefit from my own suffering a little bit. Well, speaking of bullying, when I was a kid, I was bullied. And I started making, you know, wise cracks at myself. I realized I was taking the power away from him. And I still do it today. When I see people who are going to come at me, uh, you know, start running their damn mouth, I, I'll start cracking on myself. And then they're just standing there with that, oh, I, I don't know how to react to this. And I'm like, that's right, because I took the power, bitch. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's, that's the healthy way to look at it, you know? It's, it's, uh, I don't let my, I don't let my, I don't let my mind rent space in my head. <laughs> As confusing yeah. as that sounds, I you know I realize that there's the conscious self and the and the unconscious self and uh, and and they're two. They, I don't even think they communicate with each other. That's the problem. And so when I make a joke about some of these things, I kind of feel like uh, that my unconscious mind is being talked to for the first time about it, and then they go, "Oh shit, okay, well it jigs up. I guess I better start treating him better." And the next thing I know, I start improving. And so yeah. it's a really unique perspective, but I find that, you know, comedy can be a tool. I mean, I, you know, I'm, my friend, Hari Kondvolu, you know, he uses stand up uh, to heal, you know, like racial issues and identity issues. And he uses stand up for that. You know, he feels like if you can write a joke that takes the power away or the pain away from these issues, then that's very useful. And I feel like that about things that scare me. I feel like that about, you know, joking about my mental health and joking about, you know, my abuse as a child and that stuff. Like, if I can, if I can find a silver lining in that stuff, then maybe I can help somebody else circumnavigate all those years of fucking therapy and drama and terror and just remember that if you just laugh at that, it. It, it's it really is great medicine for your soul, it, but only if you're laughing at something that's bad for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the last time my dad ever hit me. The last time my dad ever hit me, I laughed right in his fucking face, and it was the last time he ever hit me. And I think it was a real, it was I think it was a real metaphor for me uh, when I got older and looked back on on that to to go wow I didn't realize how much power that had. I didn't realize how much power that, that you know, the, the fear is, um, fear, fear looks intimidating and, and it's, it's big and it's dark and it's fucking scary, but it's really just a fucking, it's a dwarf in a trench coat. And when you start laughing, well, I shouldn't say it's a, a dwarf's a real person, so I should probably change that to any dwarves that are listening. I'm real sorry. Uh, send that email to Ari Shafir. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I feel like <laughs> I feel like um, you know it's 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 usually uh, it's people like my dad, you know that's what fear is. It's people that are really really broken 
on the inside. They they really don't have confidence, but they manipulate you uh, through uh, a fear. They manipulate you. They manipulate you through making you feel like you're worthless or have less value. And the minute that you show them that you don't need them for approval, then it breaks them in half. And you know, breaking that cycle for fear, humor is the best thing I've ever found. It's what my mom used. It's why we only had comedy albums growing up because she needed that. She had such a terrible upbringing. She found a lot of, of um, a lot of healing and, uh, and a lot of, um, a lot of resolve in comedy. And, and she was very, still open about that. She really, really used it as medicine. And we always had laughter in the house. And I'll be honest, even with my dad being a piece of abusive shit that he was, she never, ever would let that ruin her sense of humor. She would bust his balls all the time. And any time that he, you know, near the end when he would start getting adamant about, you know, his masculinity and his, you know, machismo, she would just shut it down. She'd just laugh right in his face, and it just ruined him. And all I could think is, wow, if you're that small of a person – you can't you can't even take a joke or, or have a sense of humor about any you're broken. You're dead inside. There's nothing left. And so I'd rather be on that side. I'd rather make fun of that stuff and take its power away. I'd rather joke about committing you know, me committing suicide to an audience and letting them know it's okay, we're all right. You know, some of us are on that boat right now, we're on that trip. And it's okay to laugh at it. It's gonna take all the energy away from it. You can't kill yourself if you're having a good time. Nobody's ever yeah. done that. Nobody's ever been like, wow, I'm having such a great time. I'll just kill myself now so I don't have to compete with this great time I'm having. No one's ever done that. It's when you're not having fun. It's when things are really shitty. And sometimes I think you have to self-create those things. You have to put comedy in your life. You have to have laughter in your life to remind you that anybody, anything that anything that has power over you, it certainly doesn't when you find the faults in it. And you can laugh at it, and it loses its power. Yeah, that's that's true. But I, I, I want to ask a question because, I, like I said, I watched a lot of your stuff on uh, YouTube. Uh, what's up with the clowns? <laughs> I okay, so so the clown thing now that that story now is about eight minutes long. And there's more to it now. I'm probably when I release this album, I'm hoping that that bit gets some some play because in the in the two years that I've been working on it, I've now met five people who have murdered a clown. Oh shit! Legitimately murdered a clown. I just recently met a Navy SEAL, retired Navy SEAL, uh, uh, early retirement, deferred from 15 tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, injury, PTSD. He's home now. He's uh, he went to come see a comedy show. Honestly, exactly for the reason we were just talking about. Because he he's like, if I don't have laughter in my life, then I go insane. And I he's like, I don't. I feel great when I'm around people and I'm laughing. It reminds me that life can be okay. So that's what he was doing. He was self medicating at a show that I was headlining. And after the show, he. He's friends with the owner of the club. He goes, I got to talk to this guy. And so the owner was like, hey, my buddy wants to tell you a story and uh, and get you high. And so uh, he told me about when he got back stateside, he's got this big compound. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a survival compound. He's got a fucking Gatling gun on the roof. It's a giant ranch. Uh He's got an H1 uh, that he brought over from uh, overseas uh, that he decked out in uh, armor. And he's got bars on the window. And that's his family car. And he was driving his wife and his two pit bulls and his son uh, home from dinner. And they were on their country road because they live out in the middle of nowhere. And he almost ran over a clown who was standing in the middle of the road. And when he got out, of his car. He stopped the car about a hundred feet away from the clown and got out and was like, Hey, you got to get out of the road. And he wouldn't move. And he just started laughing at him. 
And so my buddy's like, my first reaction is like, I'm just going to pull my piece and let him know that he, he needs to get out of the road and, or he needs to stand out of our, out of our way. And the clown took a run at him and he stopped and then uh, he fired a warning shot. And he's like, you come within 10 feet of me or my truck, I will kill you. I have my wife and my kid in the car, my dogs. I'm not playing. I'm an, you know, I'm a, I'm a sniper. I'm a U.S. Navy SEAL sniper. I'm a great shot. I can, I'll, I'll knock you down by, by before 10 feet. And so he goes to, he told me that the clown, he, the whole time, I forget to mention this, he had his arm behind his back, and he pulls his arm out, and he's got a machete. And then he just starts charging at the guy. And so he unloaded his entire clip into this clown's chest. And the cops came. His wife was already calling the police, and he said, you know, the cops came. I had to show them all my weapons. I had to show them everything I had in the truck, all my register, you know, I had all of my paperwork. Uh, he goes, they didn't keep us. It was self-defense. It was clearly self-defense. But they also uh, let me see the grouping because all the cops were like, holy shit, you shot this guy from like 60 feet with a handgun, and your grouping was super tight. It's all, it was so, uh, uh, they were so impressed. Oh, wow. uh, and the owner corroborated. He was like, yeah, it was in the paper and everything. He shot a clown to death. I mean, it's the fifth guy I've met who's murdered a clown, although his story is kind of my favorite. But... I don't know what it is with clowns. I mean, I, I, but that's a, you know the thing that happened in New Jersey. That that's a true story. Uh, I mean, I you know I would say I've embellished a bit of uh, like I didn't see the clown get shot, but I was there when he got shot. I was oh, right man. there. But there's some there's some embellishment. Uh, you know, it's comedy. It's okay. It's not, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not writing a nonfiction novel, thankfully, so no one can get too mad at me. But but I love ribbon clowns. It's fun. I've met a, I've I've met a fair share of of angry clowns in the last couple of years. Uh, I actually had a guy get real mad at me. Uh, I did I did that bit in a bar that it, that I already knew was owned by ex circus performers. Uh, they were all alternative circus guys, uh, uh, like the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow kind of thing. They were all sideshow performers, and they bought a bar. And they loved stand up and I knew what I was doing. I they they'd seen me. I came in, you know, and I knew I was gonna close with the clown thing and I and I knew my audience. But I didn't realize that there was a guy in the audience there was a, an actual clown uh who had an anger problem because right, it's a clown. Who which which what clown doesn't have a secret anger problem? And he got so mad he tried to flip a table. He grabbed his gigantic backpack walked right in front of the stage and gave me the finger and then told me to go rot in hell. And he split and I finished the bit. The whole audience was like, what is happening right now? And he left. And after the show, the owner and one of the bartenders came up and they were like, Oh my God, that clown thing is so goddamn funny. And, uh, it's even funnier. Uh, the guy that got mad at you, he's a dishwasher here and he's super pissed. Uh, that he has to work a day job to pay back his student loans from clown college. And I don't know what was in my mouth, but I know I spit it out laughing. Like <laughs> I couldn't believe that you had to take student loans out for clown college. Like they should pay you to go to clown college. They should pay you to go to clown college. I didn't know that you could get, I didn't even know that any reputable bank, like I got, I got, in a, I got turned down for an auto loan for a used car under five thousand dollars, Nick was like, "Nah." If I t- and I had a job and and a line of credit, and I got turned down for that loan, I can't even imagine how hard it must have been to convince a bank to part with their money when you said, "What I want to do with it is be a clown," <laughs> and this is for a college. For clowns, any reputable bank would have been like, get the fuck out of here. Get out of here. You're not real. There's no such thing as a clown college. You're, am I hallucinating? They would laugh you out of a bank. Somehow, somebody managed to take out a college loan for fucking clown college. Like, any, it, it, so, America, we deserve it. That's our new slogan. That's what I'm just going to start saying. America, we deserve it. We deserve it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, America, are great. Yeah, we deserve it. Yeah, America, we deserve it. 
That should be our new, our new left wing <laughs> slogan. Not, yeah, I like it. <laughs> so, so uh, who are your top ten favorite comedians and why? Oh man, uh, my top, my favorite, my all time favorites would be um, Pryor, Carlin. Uh, Dick Gregory, uh, Dana Gould, Pat Oswalt, Brian Posehn, uh, Maria Bamford. Um, let's see, let's see. Robin Williams, um, Rodney Dangerfield, and it'd be like somebody that really killing me right now that I that I love. Oh, 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 oh. Um, uh, upon and on trial, I, I, another one that I, I I would say that those are my top ten. I don't think I've ever not walked away from watching any of those comics or or seen it, but like really feeling uh, like I just saw the best comedian ever. Mm-hmm. So I, those are all comics that have influenced me to like either get into stand up or uh, influenced me to be a better stand up. Mm-hmm. Carlin was the I think Colin was the first one. I mean, I, I loved Bill Hicks, and I loved, I mean, I, uh, there's a, you know, I, I think a lot of people argue about um, uh, uh, Lenny Bruce, like, not being funny, but I'm like, Brent, Lenny Bruce was funny. I think he had to be around at the time, in, especially with the state of comedy at the time, but, uh, but that was very influential for me. My mom turned me on to Lenny, I think my fourth birthday, I got a double album, a live album. Uh, she wanted me to have. I was only four. That's how much she wanted me to do stand up. Uh, but I, but I, I think my top ten. Those guys aren't my top ten because they. I don't listen to them anymore. I, I got what I wanted. But the other comics, I think those are all ones that I go back to the well all the time. And Aparna is still pretty recent. I mean, Aparna has only been doing. I mean, she's only been around for doing stand up for maybe fifteen, sixteen years. But maybe you not even that long. She's just so good. I've never seen them not be amazing. So goddamn funny. Maria is uh, also the same thing. I've never seen a Maria show that isn't just life altering. I've never laughed so hard in my life. Um, Carlin is, I would say, if uh, if I had to have like a a water uh, a watermark, uh, it would probably be Carlin for me. That's who was my biggest influence getting into stand-up really i i think that that the guy the way that guy wrote a set and how he told jokes and how he wrote stories how he you know he he wasn't he wasn't looking at the clock he wasn't going how long is this bit the two minutes three minutes does it have you know three punches does it do this carlin was just such a good writer and so tight and there was no uh there were no useless words everything he put in that bit was there for a reason Jeselnik's kind of the same way. I, don't, I think he his economy, his, there's no fat in his jokes at all, and they're so goddamn funny. I've, I, uh, Carlin I got to see right before he died, and I was uh, probably another one of those things that made me feel like I should probably do stand-up before I die, you know. I should probably just buckle down and do it because this is what I've always wanted to do. But Patton is amazing. Patton um, – I started stand up again in 2006, and I would say it was, it was 100% because of uh, feeling kind of patent. And when I heard that album, I felt like I could do, I really was like, oh, there's somebody doing the kind of stand up that I've always heard in my head. Uh, but I just didn't know how to, like, I didn't know you could do it. I didn't know you could do some of those things. I didn't know that it was okay to, to you know, to, to write in that way, to, to, to take jokes to a level and then write another level and then write another level to it. And, and to, to be so, um, uh, to not rely on pop, you know, be pop cultural heavy and, but still be able to touch all the watermarks of like an eighties and nineties kid. You know, I, I love Patton. I, that album was great. I, and I've had the opportunity to, to work with him, which is even crazier. Cause I, I think, I told my wife uh, in 2005 or 2004, uh, we went to Bumbershoot, which is a Seattle uh, institution. It's a summer music and arts festival, and Patton happened to be the headliner, and I really wanted to go. 
and we went and saw Patton, and then we went to a bar across the street and got hammered, and Patton was at that bar with his manager, Dave Rath, who's my buddy now, and uh, and I was talking about how much I really think I want to start doing stand-up, for real, and Patton was the reason I wanted to do it, and then he crawled over the bench and sat next to us and got bought me scotch and got me hammered, and we talked about Star Trek, and he was super drunk, and then his manager was like, we got to go. And I, I told my wife, I'm, that's it, I'm going to do stand-up. It took me another year or so to get on stage. But I told her that night after we did it uh, that I'm that's my goal. is I'm going to get good enough to get to open for Pat. That's my goal. And then seven years later, I opened for Pat. Wow. So I, so I feel like, I feel like um, all those guys are, like my top ten, uh, it's all for the same reason. They made me want to do something. They pushed me to want to do something that I really love. And I still get replay out of it. You know, I still, Brian, I mean, holy shit, Brian's the reason I started wearing metal shirts again and wasn't afraid to talk about comic books to my friends because I was like, that's right. Like, I don't have to be afraid to be a, a dork. Like, it's okay. And uh, I, I adopted a lot of Brian's mannerisms, I think, early into stand-up. Because you mimic people. It's the way you get used to stuff. It's how you get used to being on stage. You don't want to steal their jokes, but you do mimic people, and you don't even know you're doing it sometimes. But Brian was one person I really mimicked the shit out of. So it was really, like, when I got to meet him, it was a real fanboy moment. Uh, all I wanted to do was talk about metal and serial killers, and the next thing you know, we're buddies. We've been friends for eight years now, and I've worked with him I think I've worked for, with him ever since, since the day we met. Wow. So I, I've been really fortunate. I've gotten a chance to, and not everybody gets to meet their heroes and work for their heroes, but I got really lucky. So I'm, I'm like, if, if the, you know, if this all stops tomorrow, I, I had a great ride, even though I wasn't, you know, I think, uh, I think some people do this out of, because they want to get some fame or they want notoriety. I just want to do it for the experience and, and see how far I could go, and I, I've, I think I've, I think I've surprised myself. Well, I know I've always been a bullshitter all my life, and I've had so many people around me like, you know, you should, uh, you missed your calling. You should be a comedian. And I'm like, one, uh, it's different, you know, sitting here making a bunch of people I know laugh <laughs> than standing in front of a bunch of people I have no idea who the fuck they are, and make them laugh. Because I tried it one time. We had a county <laughs> fair here, and uh, <clears throat> a bunch of them taught me, and, you know, it's a, 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 you know, come on, and you go do your stage, and, you know, we're competing with other people and all that shit. Well, I got a little toasty, and I got up there, and I seen this one old man. That's the only person I could focus on was that old man. I had that fucker laughing. Everybody else, I don't, know if they, I don't even know if they was laughing or not. <laughs> But, uh, you know, caught down old man's like, man, you did a great job. I love the son. And then this little fucking seven-year-old got up there and picked a banjo and won the contest. And I'm like, can you oh, fucking cool. believe that? <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah, the trick is, if you ever want to, if you want to win a talent contest, you can't do stand-up. You either have to tap dance or you have to have some weird circus talent. That's it. Wow. It's tap dancing or, or playing the banjo or if you, oh, holy shit, if you bring a ventriloquist dummy out, they may as well just bring you the trophy before you even make it drink a glass of water. I, I, I right. couldn't do neither. And, and the thing was, like, I had I couldn't cuss, so I made it that much harder because I'm just a natural born cusser. I mean, I came out of the womb going, what the fuck is up, mom? She didn't like it, but, you know, <laughs> doctor doctor did i don't care but uh yeah <laughs> people do all the time you know every time they want, they want me to hey bro tell me the story of what happened to you and i do and they're like, ha, ha, ha. man and i'm like no you i'm just gonna be one of those old country fat fuckers that he was funny but that's it he's dead now well ha- have you had any <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> Have you had any hecklers, you know, while you're performing? And if you do, how do you deal with them? I mean, I've had hecklers. I think every comic has had to deal with that. I, and I, I, have a, um, I have to make a distinction now because uh, being in stand-up for so long and, and being around stand-ups, the definition of what a heckler is has gotten very foggy. 
because uh, I, I watch comics lose their goddamn mind on people who are just talking during their set. And oh, uh, I got trained early on to react in anger, because that's how every comic I they were like, you get a heckler, you got to tear them apart, man. You got to tear their throat out. You got to show them their heart beating before they die. And I was like, Jesus Christ! Like, so a heckler to me is someone who. Uh, who consciously and with malice aforethought interrupts your show or or your or your pattern in order to insinuate themselves into your act. They they want to be noticed and heard, and they do it with malice because they want to. They feel uh, insignificant or in, inferior, and that's why they do. And so. That to me is much different, and and, and and the intent is different than like some lady who's talking too loud to her husband, or you know, or a couple that's like you know, or a young person checking their phone. Like, there's just people who are bad at being in public, and I don't yell at those people. Like, I I never get mad. Any I I used to do that. It was a real ha- bad habit that I learned from other comics, and then I I realized it bummed everybody out. I stopped getting mad at people because I'm like, you know what? I've done that. I've been that person who was talking too loud in the back of the room or I just forgot where I was or I had a few drinks and I just was louder than I thought. And that's, I'm a human being, you know what? Give me a shush or whatever. But uh, I, I, I've watched comics just tear people to shreds for making a noise and hecklers. I don't engage them anymore i used to and all you're doing is it's just like a it's just like a flame war if 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 you get trolled on on social media the worst thing you can do is engage that person and now you've invited them in like a shitty vampire and they're going to suck all the fun out of the room and uh, so i stopped doing that because that's what that the intent of heckling is to get a reaction and so now I, i i don't do it i either i either let the audience do it for me and i I, I'll 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 definitely acknowledge it. This is happening right now, but it's up to you guys to make a decision what we're going to do. And if it gets to a point where uh, I can't control it, then I just leave, and I let the I let the club deal with it. Once the room is reset, I've done that a couple times, uh, but I, I won't get mad at people anymore. Um, and I have people who who will say things out loud. Uh, I've you know like I said I've, I've made a couple of Trump jokes and. I know where I'm at. I know where I'm at when I do it. And I expect a reaction. So if someone gets mad or they go like, fuck you, or you're a piece of shit, that I just let that roll off my back because I asked for that response. But if it gets to the point where someone's really angry or, or really wants to engage me, I let the club take care of that. And I don't engage them. I don't want to get them more angry than they already were because – Everyone's there to have a good time, and some people just forget, like, ah, shit, I'm in a fun place, and I got mad about my real life thing, or, or I just, I, or I let it dissolve itself while I talk. I just go on to the next bit and see if it goes away, and if it does, uh, then I just, I never call it back again. I just, I try not to engage it. I think it's, um, it's unhealthy. Also, there was this culture of comics who were patting themselves on the back for for uh, handle, how they handled hecklers. And I think it's a shitty trait. I don't want to be, I don't want to be lifted above everybody horrible to someone for roasting someone or yelling at them until they left. I don't want to be, that's not what I want to be carried out of the club on people's shoulders for. I want it because I, I want that to happen because I wrote the greatest dick joke anybody's ever heard. But I don't want to pat on the back as I belittle someone until it turned into an almost fight. Because holy shit, I I almost made that happen, and I've definitely seen it happen in stand up. People just handle it wrong, and then they keep handling it wrong, and it goes down a real shitty path. And then either security or the cops get involved, or there's a fight, or someone gets a mic stand in their face. And that's not me. I'm a little dude. I can't. I don't want. I don't like to. I don't want to invite any kind of uh, uh, negative stuff. I can't because I can't. I'm too small and I'm too tiny and I can't take a punch. So, 
I diffuse things pretty quickly uh, by not paying attention, by not giving it energy. I'll pay attention to it, but I don't give it any energy. Well, that sounds that sounds reasonable, and I, and I don't blame you. I'm the I'm the type I do that too. I'll be like, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to piss you off. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think it's just an easier way to deal with it because it's more honest. It's more mm-hmm. honest to go. I knew when I I know what I was saying. I think a lot of comics who are like, oh, you're upset about that. Does that make you mad? Then you're a fucking blah blah blah. You're a snowflake. I, I, I know what I said. I know if, I know if I'm saying something to cause a reaction. I know what I'm doing. And so when people do get upset, I'm prepared for that. I'm prepared, but I try to I try to to make sure that that's that's also in the joke. Like I make sure that if I write a joke that I'm that it's going to upset people, I write it in a way that they can't get that upset. They can't get that emotionally invested in it. They can't. All they can do is go. Well, I disagree, and now I'm pissed because you've called me out. Shit. But, but I think a lot of it is just it's a, a skill set to develop is learning how to how to poke people and not stab people. <laughs> poke people, it's forgivable. If you stab people, that's an act of aggression, and that's not me. You know, I'm I'm again, I'm a little dude, and I don't want to. I'm not I'm not here to pick fights. But I am here to make fun of people and also to call shit out. And but you know, I, I, I have a tiny shadow and I'm really good at standing behind it. <laughs> you know what you don't want to hit this kid. You don't want to hit me. Look at me. My own shadow can't even stand in front of me. So <laughs> I handle I handle that differently. You know, Brian Brian and I have talked uh, in the past about like we both used to get super angry at hecklers and have both have instances where we've lost our shit on people and it feels bad. It feels like fighting with someone you love. It feels like, uh, because at that point, everyone around you is just so tuned out and bummed out. They don't want to be there anymore. And I don't want to leave that. So I like just, I like disarming people with kindness or with the sound of my voice talking over their voice. It's so much better. Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah. what happens when what happens when a crowd doesn't laugh or doesn't get the joke? How, how do you how do you handle that or proceed with that? Uh, I usually try to have some things in the pipe so that I can move to the next thing, so that I don't call attention to the fact that I say shit. Although lately I've been kind of more in the moment, so I have been calling it out, but I don't call out the audience for being shitty. It's very rare that I will shit on an audience. Uh, although I have, I. Some audience, some sometimes an audience just collectively isn't vibing. They're not vibing with each other, and they're not letting the show happen, and it affects everything. And you can't get mad at an audience, like you can't get mad at an audience. It's a collection of different psyches. Everyone's operating at a different thing. But you know, when you're in a group, you kind of react together. It's you know, group think. And I can't get mad at an audience. So uh, as much as I want to. But I've definitely been in a place where shit isn't hitting, and I'll I'll rib the audience a little bit if I feel uncomfortable. I will at least let that steam out and be like, "Whew, you guys are a lot uh, better audience than I thought you were." Because most people are really shitty, and they'll just laugh at that. Laugh at that. You know, <laughs> play with them yeah. a little bit. But I am, um, you know, if, if people aren't laughing, I do one of two things: I panic and begin to sweat visibly and then move on to the next thing. Or, you know what, I, I'll, 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 watch, I'll let it roll off my back and go on to the next thing and already try to have listened to the room and figure out what went wrong and avoid it the next time. I think I have enough material now where if things start to go sour, I got enough shit I can pull out that, that I can change the mood, I can reset everyone's palate, and begin anew. Okay. So, uh, what's your, what's your thoughts on Bill Cosby, and has what transpired with him and all these women has it has it affected the comedy world any? Well, again, I think that if anything, it it made it it actually 
was a great thing for comedy because it told, it allowed people to know at this point now we are now calling shit out. So if you got treated like garbage or if you got sexually assaulted or if you had a, a, a person make you feel uneasy or unsafe, you don't have to hide in the shadows anymore. We're, we're listening. And it was a fight. It's still a fight. But if anything, it was the progenitor of the Me Too movement. And I, I think that was very healthy for comedy because in any, in any art, in any arts community, uh, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but, I mean, when I say arts community, I mean, you know, dance, painting, uh, music, uh, uh, comedy, uh, improv, anything. Creeps hide in those communities. They do that stuff because, you know, it, it, you, you can have a cover. And there's a ton, a ton more creeps. In, in arts communities than in, in, in any place else. They hide and they, they book things and they take advantage of people and they put people in, in awkward positions, especially women in awkward positions. And, and it happened for since the beginning of, of the entertainment industry. And I think with Cosby, it finally gave women the power to go, holy fuck, you mean I don't have to just endure that? And I think that's where we saw this big spike in, in men being called out, it wasn't because it was a trend. It's because women finally realized, oh, my God, we can do this now. I can actually blow the whistle on this motherfucker and somebody will listen to me because it didn't happen for a long time. I think, I think if anything, the, 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 the positives that came out of Cosby were the fact that it gave a voice to people, especially in stand-up, women in stand-up, uh, who – really felt like they had uh, uh, been marginalized by their experience with people like Bill Cosby or Louis C.K. because they didn't have a, they weren't allowed to say anything. And Hannibal, thank God for Hannibal Burris for being, you know, uh, there was a guy that had those women's safety in mind and called it out and brought it back to the public, uh, the public's attention. But I, I, I think if anything, the, 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 if, I think it made, us, it made us a little bit more aware of what to look out for and also reminds us that we're a really small community and we got to take care of each other and we got to not make people feel unsafe. And uh, the other thing that it did is it made everybody start talking about how to separate the art from the artist. And is that even possible? Is it even possible to separate? I can't listen to Cosby anymore. I can't because it just, that is, I feel like I'm, I, I'm not, I, there's an undertone now to every one of those bits where everything he says just stinks a little bit. It doesn't feel genuine anymore because you realize that, oh, yeah, you were a fucking evil person. Holy shit. So it's really hard. It's my wife, my wife is a huge Michael Jackson fan. She can't, she can't get near it. When it comes on the radio, she's like, gag. I can't do it because all I think about now is all those people he probably hurt. And it doesn't, it just can't listen to the music because now you hear all the, you know, you, you hear the, the telegraphing of the behavior, even if it's not there. And comedy, man, if it's a shitty comic, if it was a great comic like Cosby, it makes it real hard to go back and listen to those bits because it now makes you wonder, where did that come, where did that come from? You know, how can someone who writes something so pure also be doing something so horrible? So, <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's, uh, uh, it, it makes a lot of um, – it, it rocks the comedy community. It still, still has, especially with the CK thing, uh, which is another – I think another branch of the Cosby allegations was the fact that Louie got – finally got his come up with. And it – I think I make comics, uh, male comics, all freaked out. Oh, can I even uh, look at girls anymore? Can I even, you know, talk to women? And it's like, well, yeah. Nobody said you couldn't do that. Just don't be a fucking weirdo. Yeah. We're just calling out weirdos now. That's all. We're just, you, you know, they've always existed, but we've felt, we've felt, and I've never felt comfortable calling people out because I always felt like if I say that that guy's a creep, then I'm going to get fucking blacklisted from all these things, and then I'm going to get called out because who am I? 
So, you know, yeah, there's a, there, it's complacency. And now we've realized we don't have to, we don't have to hide in that complacency. It's okay to say shit and it's okay to oust people. And it's all right to cancel people out of the fucking scene. It's all right to go, you know what? What you said or what you did was so awful. No, you don't get to just do this anymore. The rest of us work and bust our ass and, and suffer and sacrifice to get somewhere. And we also treat everyone with respect. And that's, that goes without saying. And so I don't think you get to succeed in comedy anymore. If, uh, if you do some of the work and are also a piece of shit, I think that you don't get to do this anymore. This is supposed to be fun and, and, and weirdly kind of for everybody. And, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I think if the Cosby thing taught me anything, it's that I, I, the landscape is changing in favor, uh, of transparency and that's okay with me. Uh, because I, boy, there's nothing worse than, than knowing that, uh, that there's these, there are great female comics who quit stand up because they met someone like Cosby or they got sexually assaulted or someone like Louie whipped his dick out. And then I don't get to hear their jokes anymore because they either fucking quit or they killed themselves. And that bums me out. You know, that just really, really bothers me when I stop and think about all the amazing women who, and, and the, the amazing jokes I probably could have heard if they would have, wouldn't have been uh, uh, forced out of, of the, of their, of their art by people like that. Bums me out. I agree. I agree. Well, do you have any uh, superstitions or rituals that uh, you uh, deal with before a show? No, no. In fact, I, I, I don't, I, I don't do anything because I, I think you get in your own head. And if you get in your own head, then you put pressure on yourself. And the minute you do that, it makes it hard for you to relax. And I think the key to, to, to making what we do seem natural is to trust ourselves. And uh, I don't, I don't, I knew, I knew, I used to know a guy that would shadow box before every show. He'd have to go in a corner in the green room and just furiously shadow box. And I was like, why do you do that? And he's like, I got to get pumped up for the show. And I'm like, I guess it's a ritual. You have to do what you do. I, I don't do that because I, I, maybe that's my ritual. Jesus, maybe not having a ritual is my ritual. All right, well, fuck me. I guess I do have a ritual. Just <laughs> not having a ritual. Shit. See okay, how, I just realized yeah. that. Wow. That worked out great, man, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, holy shit. What a, what a catharsis. <laughs> Well, I, I know in one of your uh, videos I watched, you, you talked about that uh, you were a big horror fan. Uh, yes. Which 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 horror movie do you uh, or movies do you find that uh, really comical? I, I mean, I know it's terrifying, but you're sitting there going, "Ain't no way." I watch. I'd be honest with you. I watch horror for the fun. I I I, I don't like. I'm not a big fan of slasher movies. I'm not a big fan of, uh, uh, I love gross out, grand guanal, you know, uh, over the top violence, <laughs> comical, but I also love like dark, quiet, brooding, uh, uh, stories of personal terror and horror, but, but I don't get, I don't get, I don't, I never really got to like the brutalizing, just brutalizing. Yeah. Look at all the amazing kills, but unless it's in something that like, like brain dead, like Peter Jackson's, you know, uh, uh, brain dead or something. But like, I, uh, I, I always tried to find horror that was so ridiculously gory that it was funny. And I, I'll be honest, I think that's really a metaphor for, for my standup. I'm sure that that's kind of where I got that idea is just the horror that I was brought up on. The movies I was brought up on were so over the top, but that, but it was also like, funny i never got scared i was never scared of that stuff i think the only three movies that have ever scared me were uh the exorcist um uh session nine and um uh oh and uh oh what's the other one it's the one i i've been trying to turn my friends on to and it's so goddamn horrific uh oh it's a hungarian movie that came out a few years ago and i absolutely can't stop watching it and it just makes me 
it just makes me feel oo- oogie every single time. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, Baskin. Oh, God. But that's like, I don't have a lot of movies that scare me. Uh, I think it's hard for horror to be scary anymore. I think it's become a, uh, the, the branding has changed where uh, I, 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 I really, uh, I loved uh, Ghost Story. I don't know if, uh, if you had, or Ghost Stories, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, was the, I think the last horror movie that I saw that I wa- had to watch multiple times because it was so well done. Because it reminded me of like the 70s Hammer uh, anthology movies, you know, Tales from the Crypt, and they were oh, it was so good. But it, I think I watch horror for the for the laughs. I think that's uh, hopefully you know a good horror movie is supposed to be kind of like a thrill ride. It's supposed to get your adrenaline up, and it's supposed to at the end, you know, the the desired effect is to sort of make you feel glad when you leave the theater, like whew, you know, I'm relieved, tension release. That was a you know, it's like eating a hot pepper. You have this endorphin rush. Your body makes this amazing chemical that sort of gets you all high afterwards. And, you know, you were scared and you were, uh, uh, you were sweating, but now you feel good. And I, I think that's what I always got out of horror, uh, less than the, um, like the, the titillation and the over the top stuff. I mean, the evil dead movies, funny uh, for me, even now the exorcist, I, I love it. Cause there's humor in that movie. I never, I never noticed. Mm-hmm. There's tons of legitimate humor. I realized what a great writer Blatty was. It took me years to get back into that movie and watch it and go, oh, my God, there's so many goddamn jokes in here. It's a really yeah. fun, smart detective movie. And I was scared because uh, – well, I was probably scared because I was raised Catholic. But now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, this is a – it's a detective movie. It's great. It's a noir thriller, but uh, Demon is the bad guy. And – uh I, I get that. I had this conversation the other night, by the way, and I don't recommend anybody uh, um, uh, submit themselves to a Serbian film, but I was uh, trying to uh, uh, I was trying to preach the merits of that movie as uh, to me as a over the top black comedy because I've wa- I watched it. I'll never watch it again, but I watched it and I laughed at stuff because I I got it. And when, yeah, you know, I was raised on that kind of stuff. I was raised on that over-the-top horror where it's, it's satire. It's a really black satire. It's a pitch black, a bottom of a mine shaft uh, a, a comedy. But, oh, man, the, the resistance <laughs> I got from people, and I understand it. But I, to me, like, I think horror and comedy can be very similar, and maybe that's where my mental illness rests is I see those things as, uh, uh, you know, that, I think that maybe that's how I, I cope with things is I, I make fun of horror and I make fun of ter- terrifying things and, and shitty things. Again, because it takes their power away. And I, a Serbian film, I loved it because I went, oh, my God, it's so awful, but it's awful for, like, for a reason. It's, it, there's, the satire is there, but you have to look for it. I love shit like that, but... It's not a popular opinion. I'll I'll tell you that much. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, and also, <laughs> and you don't have to watch it. Don't watch a Serbian film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they think it's banned in the U.S. now, so I don't think you can watch it. But I mean, uh, I illegally uh, ripped it. But oh my God, that's all I needed was one time, and I went, I went, yeah, I recommended it to Anthony Jeselnik, and when he was like, well, I was kind of thinking about watching. I was like, I had a chance. I don't know Anthony Jeselnik, but I was in a green room with him. And uh, he was talking about horror movies, and he had asked me, have you, like, have you heard of this Serbian film? And I was like, oh, my God, I've seen it. And I gave him my capsule review, and he was like, I'm going to watch it. I'm like, if anybody should watch it, it's the kind of movie I could see Anthony Jeselnik going like, oh, my God, this is really funny. Like, you have to be tuned into that kind of sense of humor already, though. Mm-hmm. It's moribund and macabre and, and, and macabre and, and – and sick and fucked up, but you know those are the things that used to make me laugh because that uh, was the, those are the things I was always facing. I love stuff. I, yeah, I'm a big horror movie fan, but I'm I'm becoming more particular about about the kind of horror that I put in my head though, because I it's got to be well done now. I loved Hereditary. I thought that was amazing. 
and I, I'm looking forward to um, uh, the the new one from from that director that's coming out Midsummer. Uh, it's the name of it, and it looks like it's going to be even better. Like, I, I get so excited even at 50 about new horror movies. I, uh, you, you, I could talk for another two hours about that stuff. But. <laughs> well, that, that'll have to be another show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we're, we're, we're winding down, and it's about nine minutes left. But uh, there's one question I want to ask you, and I know it's, it's off topic, but... Uh, Seeing how that you're uh, you're from Bigfoot country, have you ever had any experience yeah. with a Bigfoot, or do you use it in your comedy? I don't. I've had no experience with a Bigfoot, but I did join uh, when I was 22. Uh, my friends and I had a paranormal group that we just decided that we put together uh, called Nicodemus, which was our sort of paranormal activity group, and we would. Uh, we would go out. Uh, we bought equipment, and we would uh, we would go out to UFO hotspots, and <laughs> we joined the um, Bigfoot uh, Searchers Club in Washington, the Bigfoot Society. Uh, and it was, which is, you know, it's a it's a grassroots uh, uh, research group that just meets and hangs out in the woods and drinks beer and hopes that Bigfoot comes by and screams at him. But otherwise, they're mostly just you know, weekend warriors, and wow. uh, we'd go up in the we'd go up in the uh, Snoqualmie National Forest all the time, and uh, drive up to the uh, Canadian foothills and the and the mountains, uh, just to in some of the national parks before you get into Vancouver. There's a lot of Bigfoot sightings up there in eastern Washington, Wenatchee, um, but I've never never seen one. But I definitely was uh, into it and part of the uh, Bigfoot Society and uh, a proud a proud early member of MUFON until, uh, until I was like, I can't afford these dudes. And then, uh, yeah, I was super into that. I was into all that. So we were we had a lot of fun. The early 20s was uh, a really interesting time for me. It was also, I also was a libertarian who, uh, a card-carrying libertarian who, uh, who quit. I quit being a libertarian when they sent me a picture of um, – Oh, what was it? They sent me a magazine. They wanted me to, to – here's how lazy I am, by the way. Uh, I was a card-carrying libertarian until they just volunteered me to give away like 300 copies of their dumb arts appreciation magazine. And I was like, no, I'm done. I'm not a part of a political party. I quit. I've never been a member of a political party since. I'm like, I don't want to do the lifting. If anybody <laughs> else is going to give me pamphlets or magazines, fuck this. <laughs> If I gotta work, fuck like y'all. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm voting for you so that I have to do less work. Now I'm not gonna go out and fucking deliver free magazines for you. <laughs> but, but yeah, we were. Yeah, my early twenties, I was into all that shit. We went to haunted houses. We went to, uh, we went to purported haunted houses, and and uh, we would, and not just like famous ones. Like people would actually call us and and ask us to come and do research on their home because they thought they might have a, a poltergeist or a spirit. I mean, I've seen some weird shit then, but I just have, I've never seen a Bigfoot. Seen a UFO, never seen a Bigfoot. Well, I'm, I'm 49 years old and I still do it. And I do it, um, not, you know, it's a hobby, but it, I've turned it more into a hobby. But I had a Bigfoot experience here in Virginia oh. when I was in my early 20s. And I'll tell you what, it's a terrifying experience when you walk around a corner and you see this like eight foot tall, hairy female. I guess it's a female, but it looked like a female with a shorter woman beside of her. And you're, you're, you're all eyes are locked on each other and you're like, well, who's going to move first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to mention trying to reconcile with your brain what you're even looking at, you know? Exactly, because, you know, I was actually hunting, and, you know, a lot of people's like, whoa, you know, you got all these hunters out there, and they got guns, and why don't they ever shoot one? I can tell you why, because when once you make that eye contact, it's like you can see a human there that's covered in fur, and you know if you take a shot, you're killing it, and that's a terrible feeling, and I, I just took a step back. Finally, had the balls to take a shot. I mean, it seemed like it was forever standing there. 
But I took a step back. They took a step back. I'm like, okay, so we are understanding that we're going to back the fuck up from each other. <laughs> but that's yeah, so after I, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that's a second pair of pants moment. Oh, you got that right. You got that right now. After I backed up all the way back around the corner where I couldn't see them no more, I heard them go down a hill. And I, I was just like, you know, breathing real heavy. And then I started laughing like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't this some funny shit? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not going to hunt for a while. Y'all have, y'all, good luck. Bye. <laughs> good luck. Have at it. Y'all on y'all. But yeah, that was my experience with that. Oh, that's amazing. It, it, it is amazing, but I tell you, when I even when I talk about it, I get them goose pimples because of, you know your hair raises up because you're like, oh god, what the fuck am I gonna do? Yeah, well, what, how do you you know how do you reconcile it to even? I mean, it's a cryptozoological uh, 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 miracle. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, still an uh, unproven but 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 real thing that uh, very few people have seen. Yeah, and, and and if you do tell people that you've seen this, a lot of them are like, okay, what was you smoking? What were you drinking? What kind of pills were you taking at the time? And, you know, you, yeah, nothing. <laughs> I wish it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, there, that was my story, too. I, I guess I, I didn't mean to take up your two minutes. I, I apologize. I'm terrible. No, that's host. right. I wanted to hear your story. That's why I wanted to ask you. I was, I, I, I'm fascinated by that stuff. <laughs> but, uh, like I said, we, we're down in about three minutes. And Dude, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. We got to get you back on. Uh, you know, there's a whole, you know, we shoot shit. I'm one of these people. I can shoot shit all night. Uh, a lot of my guests yeah. are like, dude, shut up. I got to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's perfect timing because I'm on the East Coast right now, too, so the time lined up. Well, that's great. Normally, I think right about now, if I was on the other coast, I'd probably be in a club right now. Yeah. That's what I'll, you know, when it comes to comics, when I ask them to come on the show, I'm often worried about that, but it's always worked out pretty good. (laughs) So they normally, I don't know if they plan to come this way <laughs> or when they give me a date, they're like, yeah, I'm both. it's going to work out just fine. So what are your plans for the rest of 2019? You know, uh, I know you talked about you got an album coming out and you got any other projects yeah, that you're to uh, talk about? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still working furiously on this dumb book, uh, but in the meantime, you know, I'm working on the album and, uh, Hopefully, just trying to working on getting the show sold out for the 25th of May, and then I've got you know another couple of like two or three week tours that I'm out, and uh, mainly just trying to stay busy for for the rest of the year, and uh, and already starting to get into 2020 and 2021. So I'm hoping that we just stay busy. That's all I want to do is I want to just make sure I keep getting to do this, uh, and. And it's that it's fun, you know, that it's still fun. And uh, but uh, that's my my goal right now. You know, the the economical goals are I'm getting more uh, planes and more hotels, more of that. That's what we're. That's our new plan. That's my wife and I are like, let's more hotels, more planes. That's when we know. Mm-hmm. That's when we know the paychecks get a little better. When I don't hey, have to pay yeah. for my own plane tickets and my own hotels, and we're we're getting there. We're getting more planes and more hotels. So. The more I get that, the more I get to go do the fun stuff that I really love. The little guys, the little shows, the one-nighters. Those are my favorite. Well, that's awesome. But everything, well, everything's coming up sheen, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, if anyone's interested, <laughs> you kind of caught me off that. I'm trying to read. I was trying to read my letter, trying to read my goddamn notes, and then you caught me with the sheen, and I'm like, I'm trying to giggle, not giggle. Okay, if anybody's <laughs> interested in finding out more about your concerts or – your shows or any questions or thoughts or, uh, or any schedules for your uh, tour dates, uh, you can go ahead and tell them, tell them what's up. Well, you can find me at Derek Sheen Rules. It's D-E-R-E-K-S-H-E-E-N 
R U L Z dot com. And that has all of my up to date calendar, uh up to date clips and news, uh ticket links for shows. Uh you can also find me on Twitter at Derek Shane and Instagram at Derek Shane six six six. Uh and then, you know, Facebook who does that anymore? But if you want to follow I'm there, i am constantly just uh uh, defending myself from my political views. So drop drop in there sometimes, super fun. Uh, but, but Twitter, Instagram, and, and my website, you can catch all that. And also standuprecords.com. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> you did. You caught me with the sheen, man. You did. You caught me with the sheen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still stuck what on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Derek, again, man, it, it was an honor to have you on the show. You know, nothing but respect for what you're doing, and and keep up the good work. I'll be watching, and if you ever get by close to where I'm at, let me know, and I'll come and watch you. Shoot shit with you, drink. You got well. it, my friend. I'll drink a water with you. How's that? Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Or a diet coke. I'll drink a diet coke. <laughs> Ugh, I'll drink a coke. <laughs> yeah, diet coke. Yeah. Diet coke. I'm, on. I'm with you. Uh, I appreciate you having me on, my friend, and uh, I do look forward to uh, coming to your neck of the woods sometime. Oh, it would be awesome. I'd love to have, we'd love to have you all out here this web coast. Lord knows these fuckers around here need a good laugh. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll see what I can do. Okay, man. Well, you have a good night and great weekend. Happy Easter and all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, keep your pellet dry. You got, I love it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Take care. You you too. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for us tonight. I want to thank the Sheen, Derek Sheen, for coming on the show, man. You know, that that was a great show. Loved it. Um, I'll be taking a, a break next week. I won't be on next Thursday. But I'll be back on May 2nd with my special guest, the Ice Queen and co-founder of Paranormal, Paranormal Investigations and Paranormal Investigator with Reap Investigations, Amy Green. Damn, that was a mouthful. Thanks again. Uh, until, until a couple weeks, everyone have a safe weekend. Everybody have a happy Easter. Everybody have a good night. And I love you all. Ciao. I know you all hear me say this all the time. Where's my damn button? Let me see. Where, seriously, where is my damn button? Uh, oh, here it is. That's it for us tonight. I want to thank everyone that took the time to listen in. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vibe Radio Network and to Ryan for putting up with us. Also to all the first responders and our men and women in the armed services. Thank you for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families make every day to keep our great nation safe. Tune in next week to another exciting show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everyone can go to our Facebook page within the chaos and don't forget to like our page uh, to see upcoming guests along with past shows, postings, or you can also go to uh, my website at www.blackdiamondps.org or blogtalkradio.com forward slash vibe radio network. Also, we have a YouTube channel, so go to YouTube, look up Within the Chaos for past shows. Thanks again. Until next week, everyone have a safe weekend and have a good night. And love you all. Be careful out there.
sorry. But I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women, and little children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed. The bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite!